if you have your Bibles, uh, whether it's on your phone or a hard copy, feel free to grab that because we're going to be doing some uh, text study in this session. We'll be looking at the uh, uh, parables of Jesus and comparing those to parables of the uh, rabbis from his time. Uh, last time when we left off, we were at Beersheba or Beersheba. Um, and uh, we're going to pick up right there and I'm going to sort of use this, uh, uh, this flight module to set the stage for uh, Jesus' uh, telling of parables. So in uh, Beersheba, in the far south, I wanted to get us up to Jerusalem. So we're going to take the road up into the hill country of Judah, the hill country of Judea, and we're going to go past Hebron or Hebron, right about here. And we're going to continue on to Jerusalem using this route up in uh, the ridge route in the hill country. You see it descends on, into the Judean wilderness here, chalky white stuff, descends down onto the coastline that way. So we're up on a spine, a ridge that runs north-south through the land of Israel and we're following that. We come to the city of Bethlehem. Bethlehem's 15 miles from Hebron. I pointed that out a minute ago. Bethlehem is five miles if you keep going north up the ridge to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Bethlehem, five, six miles apart. Continue down the Jerusalem Jericho Road. We were looking at that earlier, but you're going down into the wilderness, following the Roman road to Jericho, the oasis here. You guys remember this from first session, right? I know I could trust you with all of that. All right. Typically, travel from Jerusalem, even by Jews. I've written on this in an um, article called Did Jews Travel Through Samaria in the Time of Jesus? Question mark. Uh, it's online. You can read it if you're interested. Typically, Jews did travel, contrary to popular opinion, right through the heart of Samaria. And you go past Bethel, you go past Shiloh, you go past Shechem, and finally you get to that Jezreel Valley that marks the beginning of Jewish occupation in the first century. Now you're out of Samaria, this is all Samaria. Get out of Jewish occupation in the Jezreel Valley and on to the Nazareth Ridge. Jesus is mostly ministering in this area on the uh, north and northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee though. And so that's the, that's the context of both of these parables that Jesus tells about fathers. Um, the parables that we're going to look at are the only parables that Jesus talks about fathers. All right? So uh, let's pick up with Matthew chapter 7. And you've heard these words before, ask, seek, knock, right? One of the things that we're going to learn about Jesus is that he has some really specific ways of teaching, methods or modalities of teaching. One of the things that he does is that he's reusing a literary form that he's learned from his Bible, the Hebrew Bible. And it's called Hebrew Poetic Parallelism. So it's in Hebrew, it's used by Hebrew speaking people. Poetic meaning is that it's a form of poetry and parallelism means that you're basically making the same point multiple times. Two times, three times, up to even at certain points in the Old Testament, five times. Making the same point using different words each time. Jesus does this in his own teaching because he's so familiar with this literary form and all of the people because they're such a biblically literate society they're familiar with this form Jesus chooses to use it in his teaching as well he's comfortable with it his audience is comfortable with it and they're able to make that kind of connection so ask seek and knock I've lined all of those up because they are in poetically parallel position 
it will be given to you. You will find. It will be open to you. You see how he's making the same point using uh, in different ways each time? For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it shall be open. You're going, okay, well this is just straightforward teaching. Where's the parable? Well, what Jesus does is he connects this with a little tiny parable that most scholars don't even identify as a parable. And yet it is. Because if you look at the definition of parable, a parable is a teaching technique used, it's been used for 200 years by the time that Jesus gets there in the flesh. So he picks up on this popular teaching technique, parable, and a parable is being, has been used for 200 years, and it's a snapshot of everyday life, described in word form, used by master teachers to illustrate a spiritual reality, a spiritual dynamic, a spiritual principle, a comp an aspect of God or of the kingdom of God. So parable is being used in that way now for two centuries, almost as long as the United States has been an independent nation. And Jesus comes along and he picks right up where previous rabbis have gone before and he says, and watch the snapshot of everyday life, what man is there among you when his son shall ask him for a loaf will give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? Do you see how he's made the same point two different ways? He's still talking about the same person, man, a, a, a father figure, and, and the same figure, a son. If he asks for uh, bread, we'll give him a stone. If he asks for a fish, we'll give him a scorpion. It's making the same point. Jesus does this all the time. My yoke is easy and my... Is there any difference between those two statements? My yoke is easy, my burden is light. No, it's absolutely making the same point. Foxes have their holes and birds of the air have their nest, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Has he just made the same point two different ways? Foxes have a place to sleep, birds have a place to sleep, but I don't. That's the lifestyle that I've chosen. He's making the same. Our Father, the one who is in heaven. It's basically making the same point. Sometimes one part clarifying a little bit the previous part. All right. Very quickly before we leave this. If his son shall ask for a loaf of bread, we'll give him a stone. Do you remember when Jesus was being tempted by the devil? That this was one of the temptations? Command these to become bread. So the, the, the connection is a lot closer than what we would think. You know, we go to the store, we've got it all divided up, you know, it's already sectioned off into slices, it's packaged neatly, it has Wonder Bread or something like that on the, on the outside, and that's our bread. It bears no resemblance to a stone, but if you take a roll that's maybe made from scratch, come on ladies, help me. All right, make that just a little bit bigger and you've got a stone lying there on the hillside of Galilee or Judea. So the connection is much closer. This kind of handmade, hand-baked uh, loaf of bread that does resemble a stone. All right, and then if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? The actual word in the original language, Greek, here is some kind of something like a sea serpent and you have sea snakes in the Sea of Galilee that are poisonous a man got bit by one in 2013 and because he was out in a, on a sandbar camping and they had to the family members had to try to get him to a jeep and then try to get him to the hospital there in Perea the same one that I went to that night with Gil um, the, the, the man passed away he died of the... So this is the connection. This is still a reality in Jesus' day. You can read this. I, I found that on the internet. So you just type in man bit by serpent on Sea of Galilee. You'll find exactly the article that I'm talking about. This happened seven years ago in 2013. Is that crazy? So no... 
no dad in his, in his right mind is going to give a kid who's asked for, hey, dad, could I have some fish for lunch, for dinner or whatever, is going to give him one of these little short poisonous sea serpents. It's kind of like seagoing copperheads. Uh, a fish will give him a snake, will he? Um, then if you, being evil, uh, we've all sinned and come short of God's glory. We're all fallen human beings, okay? That's our proclivity or our inclination. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give to those who ask him. So he's drawing this connection, watch this, between this man who's identified as a father because he's got a, come on, all right, and now we're his children and our father is in heaven is going to give good gifts to those who ask him. Isn't that neat? I love Luke's version of this. Sometimes Luke and Matthew are running parallel lines and Luke has um, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? That empowerment that God has provided and intends for us all to um, receive and walk in to live the kind of lives that he's called us to exceptional, unusual lives with a high bar, high level of expectation. That's only possible through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So we see that the basic nature of a dad is that he's good. We being evil, but this, this father is good. He's going to give good gifts to those ch sons and daughters who ask. He's also, this, this dad is a provider. And he's also a God, because he's so good, you can trust his hand. He's not going to give bad stuff. I just remember that, you know, when I was struggling with this business of life in the spirit and I was coming from a, a different kind of a different religious or denominational or theological background and I was struggling with this business of, you know, I, I don't want to be walking around in a, in, in a, you know, a supermarket or something like that and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit takes control of me and I fall down and start rolling around on the ground and, you know, doing crazy stuff and, you know, talking out of my head and that, that's not the God that we serve. He's a good God and his gifts are good. And when I finally received, it was because I got to a point where I said, God, I am so thirsty and I know that you're good and you're not going to give me anything that's not good for me. And then you're not, you don't want to withhold anything that, that is good for me. So I just opened myself up and I'm just asking you to pour in everything that's good and you keep away from me all kinds of weird stuff that I've heard about you know and I'm afraid of but I'm trusting your hand and that's exactly where God met me and it doesn't have to be any place special either for me it just happened to be I was riding down the road in the middle of the night in northern Mississippi sitting in the back seat of a car because God's able to reach wherever we are Makes, it's not a respecter of persons. He's not a respecter really of places either. Backseat of a car is just as good a place as anywhere else for this to take place. For God to empower us to live the way he's called us to live. Not doing it on our own. It's not in our strength or wisdom or creativity. He's the one who wants to enable us to live the way he's called us to live. I want to look at another parable. This one is maybe a little bit more familiar, and this is one that has indeed been identified as a parable. <clears throat> in the same way, Jesus starts out this passage. And you've got to ask yourself, in what way? What was he just talking about? Well, he's just told two other parables about stuff that was lost. A lost sheep, remember he leaves, God is like the good shepherd that leaves the 90 and 9 and goes and finds the one that's in distress, in trouble, and brings them back into the fold and into safety, into the protection of the shepherd, into the, uh, the pr provision of the shepherd, into the guidance of the shepherd. And so he's told that and he's also told a story about a lost coin. Now he's going to tell a story, he doesn't really describe it like this, but you've got to connect the dots. He's going to talk about a lost son okay that then introduces father son thing in the same way I'm telling you there's joy in the presence of uh, God over one sinner who repents and he said following along chapter uh, 15 verse 10 now chapter 15 verse 11 a certain man had two 
sons. Well, that automatically identifies the man as a father, okay? And later on, you'll hear that father language um, in the parable itself. Jesus will incorporate that. And the younger of these two sons said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. He divided his wealth between them. He granted the wish of this son who he knows is about to go off the rails. Any dad that's approached by a, a son before the dad ever dies and says, okay, I want what's coming to me, you know he's already headed in the wrong direction. True or false? Okay, so he, do, he, he grants the wish anyway. Fathers, with, a, with the right amount of slack in the rope, the right, right amount of, you know, uh, uh, slack in, in, in the uh, fishing line, will give a, a, a son or a daughter enough flex, enough leeway to go and, and have some experiences, even negative ones, to fall on their face, to learn from that, to come back, to get more instruction, more guidance, to then go out and you give them a little bit more leash, you give them a little bit more slack in the line. This is the way, come on y'all, this is the way we parent, right? It starts with just a little bit of slack. Now this guy, this dad, this guy's an older, he's, he's a grown man. He can make it on his own. He's given him quite a bit of slack. But this is the way God has created us. We are free moral agents. He is not encoded in us some kind of an operating system, some kind of a program in the back that makes us do what he wants us to do. There's a reason for that. Why would God create us with, what, with this incredible ability to exercise free will and to choose stuff that doesn't please him, that doesn't honor him, that's, that's unhealthy for us, um, that's not a good example of him and his children out there in the world? Why does God grant that? He wants us to love him with all of our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, with all of our mind, voluntarily. Voluntarily. It's willful, voluntary love that he's looking for to establish this relationship, to be the basis of this relationship between him and us. That's one of the reasons why even in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, we have a dozen or so times specifically and then um, a lot of other times kind of insinuated, you know, reading between the lines, God being described as Father. And uh, Jesus is picking up here uh, on this theme, began, begun in his Bible, and now he's trying to communicate these same kinds of dynamics. God is a Father and he's a good Father. He will, he's not a tyrant. He's not a dictator. He wants to be loved, related to, obeyed voluntarily. What a risk he took, huh? Yeah. So, the son gathered everything that he had. He went on a journey to a distant country. What this is telling us is that this boy moved from this very ob observant, very Bible-oriented, um, first century Jewish Galilee off into a pagan land. And that's the reason we find harlots and we find riotous living and we find swine being raised, right? So we've got this kind of uh, the us and them sort of thing that Jesus' audience, they pick up on this. They understand. They know exactly. They even, the reason why Jesus is using parable, a snapshot of everyday life that's then applied to illustrate a biblical principle or spiritual reality or heavenly reality. Um, and so everybody knows about this. They've, it's either happened to them or they know somebody that this kind of thing has happened to. That's the way that parable functions. Goes into a distant country, a pagan land, and there he squandered his estate, what was his inheritance, with loose or riotous living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country. He began to be in need. He went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed pigs. 
swine. Now, get the picture. Jesus is a rabbi. He's dressed like a rabbi. He's got disciples like a rabbi. He talks like a rabbi. He's using um, literary forms, teaching techniques like parable, like rabbis do. He's got a whole bunch of people sitting around listening to him who are Jewish and observant and they know the Bible and they're doing everything they can to live by the Bible and stuff like that. And so when he says that this guy uh, is going out and feeding pigs, you, you almost get this, oh man, that hurts so good, you know? They won't have anything to do with these animals. And he's out there spending his whole day with them, feeding them, t tending them, taking care of these animals that have been forbidden by the law of Moses. So this is the, they're getting this 3D HD, Jesus' original audience. And this is our goal as well, to try to put ourselves, whether by digital or whether by going there and immersing ourselves in the world of the Bible for a week and a half, two weeks, we're trying to get to where we can hear this stuff the way that Jesus' original audience heard this stuff. That's the whole goal. It's not just, you know, yeah, it'd be a great way to blow some, you know, time off or, you know, spend a whole bunch of money or go on a cruise or whatever. It's fun. But the whole goal is put yourself into the world of an original participant in the ministry of Jesus. That happens. I'm telling you that happens. It's what's kept me going back. There, you know, three, six months out of the year, um, you know, thousands and thousands of people studied there, teach there, um, a guide course for Israeli guides in September, did one back in December. Um, that's, that's what we're trying to do, is to place ourselves back into the world of the Bible. So he attached himself to one of the citizens of that country, and he started to feed uh, the man swine in the fields. As he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods, these are likely carob pods. They grow on trees, they're about that long, they have seeds in them, they're brown carob pods. We have a, a, a couple of versions here in the United States. They are edible. Anybody deer hunt in here? See videos of these sometimes it looks like a deer is smoking a cigar. It's a carob pod. Okay? They at least grow in the Ozarks. Alright, so filling his stomach with the pods that the, the swine were eating and no one was giving anything to him. He's away from family, he's away from friends, he's away from familiar surroundings. He's not in his Jewish culture that has been taught from the time they're able to, to speak and to understand human speech, you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. These guys are pagans, they're not living according to that law. So nobody's helping him out at all. And then he came to his senses. This is what we're praying for so many of our grandkids and our children, right? You got them on your prayer list. Do you ever pray, Lord, help them come to their senses? I have. Uh, he came to his senses and he said, how many of my father's hired men? So he comes from an affluent family. They've got servants. They've got folks that work for their uh, family in the family business of agriculture and the like. Fathers hired men have more than enough bread but I'm dying here with hunger. I'm going to get up. Remember that this is, you've got to remember this. He's saying this to himself. You're going to have to watch what he's saying to himself with what actually gets said when he goes home. So he's practicing. Yeah? I'm going home to my father and I'm going to say to him, Father, again, this parable is about father. You're making the connection between our earthly father and God the father, right? Jesus is intending that. If you've made that connection, good, he intended that. Father, I have sinned against heaven. It sounds so Jewish because sometimes you hear the kingdom of heaven in Matthew. If you look over in the parallel place in Luke, it says the kingdom of God. Why is that? Because in the first century, Jewish people were doing everything they could to avoid saying the names, the, the 
the holy names of God and even the word God. So often instead of kingdom of God, which we know is what's being referred to in this very Jewish gospel of Matthew, they use kingdom of heaven. He uses kingdom of heaven. Father, I have sinned against God and in your sight. So against God and man. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. I didn't draw the line under that, but I want you to, okay? Make me as one of your hired men. Because when he gets home and actually has this conversation in real time with his dad, he doesn't get to that point. And there's a reason for it. He didn't forget. He wasn't embarrassed, so embarrassed that he couldn't, just couldn't enunciate the words. There's another reason. So he got up and he came to his father. But while he was still, now this is so good, y'all. This is about God. This is a word video about how God acts. When he was still a great way off, his father saw him and felt what? Compassion. That's that chesed or covenant loyalty that we read about so often in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament. It's the word most often used to describe the nature of God in the Bible. Covenant loyalty. It's, it's, God is moved to act on behalf of those that he loves. He felt compassion for him and he ran and embraced him and kissed him. This is, let's take what Jesus is intending and apply it to God. This is a God who takes the initiative. He doesn't wait for us to make the first move. I've heard that in evangelistic meetings. God's just waiting on you to make the first move. No, he's not. He's already made it. He's been pursuing He's been wooing, he's been convicting, he's been drawing people that are not in relation, right relationship to him. He's been creating circumstances in people's lives where someone comes in, a, new, a newcomer, or somebody at work says something to them, or they read something in a book, or they see some billboard on the, on the uh, road as they're riding down the road. God is creating circumstances in the lives of the people that he is actively pursuing on his own first initiative to draw them to him. It's never by any uh, misstep or forgetfulness or uncaring attitude by God that someone goes their own way. God is, uh, one poet described him as the great hound of heaven that pursues the sinner to the ends of the earth, to the ends of the earth. That's a really neat thing about God, isn't it? You know, it, the New Testament says, and this is the love of God. Not that we first loved him, but that he first loved us. Paul will say in the book of Romans, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How cool is that? that that's the God that's being described here in this word video that we call a parable. He ran and embraced him and kissed him. Now the son is practiced up. He's been doing this over probably in the Decapolis. He's been practicing this thing. And so he starts his shtick. He begins his spiel. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. Remember, he's practiced this, right? He's got this all worked out. And I am, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So far, so good, right? But the father stops him right there. And he says to his slaves or servants, go out and get a whole bunch of stuff and let's have a party. We'll come back to that in just a minute. But I want to ask you, what got left out? He was practicing. He had this whole speech made up. What's missing here in real time? Make me like one of your hired servants. What does the dad do? He basically crowns him as, as the crown prince. Put a robe on him. Put a ring on his finger. Make a, kill the, the fattened calf. Let's make a feast. Let's be merry. The dad cuts him off. No, when we come back to God, whether it's, whether it's the first time or it's the tenth time, he runs and meets us. He doesn't wait for us to make our way all the way to him. Praise God. Thank God for that, yeah? God felt compassion. And while he was a great way off, he got up and ran to meet this wayward son. 
That is so neat. But before the son could ever say, you know, I've sinned in, in the sight of God and, and in your sight. Now make me like one of, come on, help me with this, one of your hired servants. Instead, he, this God makes us the center of his attention, restores us, renews us, forgives us, reconnects with us. All, watch this. It's like nothing ever happened. Squandered all the wealth, went off to a pagan land, feeding pigs, probably still smelled like them. Just guessing. It's not in the story, but stuff happens, right? And he has still got the paganism dripping off of him, and this father runs out and embraces him and clothes him. Let's pick up the story. He says, um, Put a robe on him, the best robe. Put it on him and put a ring on his hand. The Greek reads really interestingly here. It says, and give a ring on his finger. Do we use that kind of language in English? What do we say? Put, okay. So that translation is reflecting the way we would say it. But the Greek reads, give a ring on his finger. There's some really neat archives now that you can search digitally. There's one called Thesaurus Linguae Greca. You don't have to write that in your notes. It's just out there. And you can type in these words and it will give you every place in ancient Greek literature where that phrase shows up. So this is pretty simple. That You don't have to be a genius to do this. You don't have to stay up night after night also looking through hard copies of, Th of Thucydides and Herodotus, Diodorus, etc. And looking up this, trying to figure out where does this show up and in what way. Well, I'm just going to give you the real short story of this. It doesn't show up anywhere. Not in ancient Greek literature. We're talking about Homer, you know, and stuff like that. Plato, Socrates, it doesn't show up there. It doesn't show up in any of the Greek of Jesus' day, like in the writings of Josephus or the writings of Philo or any of the contemporaries of the New Testament. It doesn't show up anywhere else in the New Testament. In other words, it doesn't show up at all. This is the only time in all of this ancient Greek literature, New Testament included, where that phrase shows up. It never shows up like this. So guess what? That means it's not Greek. It isn't good Greek. Luke's recorded it here. Luke is capable of the best Greek in the whole New Testament. He'll write that kind of stuff in the book of Acts and sometimes in the Gospel of Luke. But this is the only story. Luke is telling it. It's the only version. And this is the only place in the whole New Testament that says, give a ring on the finger. Well, guess what? When you go to the works of the ancient rabbis and you go to early Hebrew literature, it's all over the place. It's everywhere. That's the way you say, put a ring on the finger. In Hebrew, you use the verb natan. You natan, you give a ring on the finger. It is an idiom. It's kind of like, he's worth his salt, or I'm hungry as a horse. I could eat a horse. Or eat your heart out. You know, those are idiomatic, figurative speech. It's unique to the Hebrew language. What we've just done, guys, is we've gone back 21 centuries. We've even jumped past the Greek that the Gospels are, have been recorded, have been preserved, these words of Jesus, and we've gotten back to the original words that Jesus spoke 21 centuries later. That's fun. In a real nerdy, Bible, geeky kind of way, okay? I got that. But that's really neat because what we did using, whether it's, ancient forms of literature or geography or now we're using language, we've just taken a step closer to that first century Jewish land of Israel original Jesus. Now that's kind of neat that we can even do that kind of stuff. But so I, I guess I can say thank God for computers and databases and stuff like that even though I hate them all. And they all hate me so it's even, you know. That's the reason that that projector wasn't working. It's only because I was in the building, Pastor. If I was, I could step out in the parking lot. That would have fixed it. <laughs> Give a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. The guy probably evidently had come home shoeless. 
Bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. All right, you've heard this. It's on TV. Um, it, it's, it, it's on CNN. Every, t every once in a while they'll interview somebody and you, they talk about the born-agains. You know, these evangelicals, they, they claim this born-again experience. And it, it's almost become kind of a, a, a badge of dishonor, you know. It's like, what, it, what sense does that make in any language, being born again? I don't know, ask Nicodemus. How can a man be born again, John 3? How can a man be born again? Can he re-enter his mother's womb and come out again? It's figurative language, Okay. This guy, it's like, we've, we'd written him off. And he's been gone so long, we just assume the worst and, and we'll never see that son again. This is a new start for him. A fresh start, like as though he never left. Put a, the best robe on him. Get the party started. Give a ring on his finger. Let's make him basically royalty now that he's messed everything up. Squandered the inheritance. Okay, so this is, a, this is a hit the restart button, guys. Remember when we were going to restart our relationship with Russia? Never mind. Um, <laughs> didn't quite work out so well. Um, uh, this, is, this is the e hit the easy button at, what is it, Staples? Yeah, that's what's going on here. This is the language of come to life again, of new birth. You'll hear about it in the Gospel of John. You must be born again. We hear about it in the works of uh, the writings of Peter at the end of the New Testament about born again. So it's not something that's unique to John 3. It's not something that only shows up in the Gospel of John. We've got it here in Luke. In fact, we've got it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a text in the Dead Sea Scrolls describing the actions of the Messiah when he arrives. This text was written at least a hundred years before Jesus' ministry began. And it says he's going to do this and he's going to do that. Read it in Isaiah chapter 61. He's going to be able to cause the, the deaf to be able to hear, the dumb to be able to speak, the, 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 um, the lame to be able to walk. And it says, and he will michaye et hametim. He will bring to life the dead. That's new life. That's, quote, new birth kind of language. So we get it right here in the Gospel of Luke. We get it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We get it in the writings of Peter. And yes, of course, we get it in John chapter 3. But this whole idea of having a, of God, because of his compassion and mercy, giving us a new start in life, a, a, a 2.0 upgrade, a new relationship started out with him, a clean slate, forgiven, reconciled to our Father. How cool is that? So we don't have any need for anybody. I'm not interested in anybody making fun of us anymore about, you know, these, these people that claim to be born again or these born agains, these evangelicals that claim a, a born again experience. It's in the Hebrew Bible in germ. It's in the Dead Sea Scrolls, very clearly written out as part of the activity of the Messiah. It's here in Jesus' original parable about the uh, lost son, call him the prodigal son, but the lost son. Um, it's, all, it's in the writings of Peter. It's all over the place. So we don't have any reason to ex make excuses for, be apologetic about, or be ashamed of this business of born again. I am born anew, again, in the old Hebrew way. This is Hebrew stuff. Dead Sea Scrolls is all Hebrew. Old Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, that's all. He this is... This stuff has a heritage that goes way, 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 way back. This is not something that got started in the evangelical movement in the 1950s or 60s or something like that. This, is, this stuff has got roots, got background, got history. No, no reason to be, to, to be apologetic about that. Now his older son was coming in from the field and when he came in and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. I guess they weren't AG. Never mind. Um, uh, and <laughs> what I'm wondering about is how do you hear dancing? Okay, it was tap dancing. Um, that is legal though, right? Okay, all right, just making sure. 
I got it on good authority. I heard a yes. <laughs> Summoned one of his servants and began inquiring about what these things might be. What in the world is going on with my family and in my house? And he said to him, who, who in the world's talking now? You ever get, can you, you, you have to do some math on this though, don't you? Do you know that this is not this business of pronouns being all over the place and you having to go, wait a minute, I've got to go back in the story and figure out who's talking. Even in that thing, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, you know that John 3, 16? We're not sure whether John the Baptist says this or whether God the Father is saying this, or whether the writer of the Gospel of John is saying this, because the pronouns are all over the place. Bottom line, it doesn't really matter. But I'm just saying there's a really famous passage where it's not all that clear about who's saying what. Who's saying the what we know, for God so loved the world. Who's saying that, though? He said to him, so you've got to do the math. This is another component of the Greek language that doesn't really even exist. It's always really clear who the speaker is, who the he or the she or the it or they or who, the, who it is that's being referred to. The Greek language is very highly developed and very specific about its points of reference in its pronouns. Nouns standing for pronouns or nouns, other nouns standing for other nouns. All right. In the Hebrew language, this is, the, is always a problem. So that's again a, 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 an indication that this parable was originally spoken in and then was transmitted by word of mouth until Luke got a hold to it and wrote it down, was originally transmitted not in Latin, not in English, not in German, not in Greek, but rather in the same Hebrew that Jesus spoke in his home that was being studied and written in, in the Dead Sea community at the same time that Jesus is doing his ministry, the Dead Sea community is alive and well. Wouldn't be destroyed until A.D. 68. Spring of 68, according to the first century author Josephus. And he said to him, your brother, he the servant, said to him, the older son, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's received him back safe and sound. So he got angry. He wasn't willing to go in. Have you ever seen Christians respond that way? Well, yeah, but they're from the other side of the tracks. Well, their hair is too long. Don't you know that they're smelling? Look at all those tattoos. Well, he rode a motorcycle to, to church, for God's sake. You know, that, that sort of stuff. He's, look, he's in my place where I always sit in the pew. Chas uh, shalom. <laughs> And I'm not going to translate. <laughs> he wasn't even willing to go in. This sometimes happens. Here's Jesus' encouragement. Don't be like that. Let the Spirit of God empower you and work you through, enable you to get beyond that and to embrace those whom the Father has embraced. Not willing to go in. His Father came out. Notice he meets the older son in the same way he met the younger son. He's no respecter of persons. He doesn't have, quote, favorites. Boy, that is, that is so neat. I'm thankful for that. I don't have a real heritage in this. My wife, the same situation. I'm grateful that the father makes, is no respecter of persons. He doesn't rank us. We do. He doesn't. The father came out and began entreating him. That's, a, that's kind of a fancy word for begging him. For the love of God, older son, please come join us. But he answered and said to his father, bam, there's a third indication that this was originally given in Hebrew and transmitted in Hebrew and only later written down in Greek by somebody like the gospel writer Luke. Answered and said, where do we hear that kind of language first? The Old Testament slash Hebrew Bible. Why do we call it the Hebrew Bible? Because it was written in? Hebrew. 
Hebrew. Okay, so this is originally, we are getting, I think it's so cool what Luke has done here. He has preserved, even though it's not common in his language, in Greek, his mother tongue, he's preserving these Hebrew idioms, figures of speech, like answered and said, like give a ring on his finger. He's preserving this even though it's not common in the language he's writing. It's not good Greek, it's great Hebrew. He answered and said to his father, look, um, by the way, answered and said, nobody asked this guy a question. There's no question mark up here. Son, please come in. That's a request, that's not a question. It would be, son, why are you standing outside? That would be a question. And then it would be okay in English, and he answered. But this guy's not answering a question. It's just said like this in Hebrew. Just like give a ring, not put a ring. He answered and said to his father, look, for so many years, I have a, an adopted brother that I love dearly, like my own blood. We prayed for that guy for 25 years. Don't quit. Do not, God hasn't, do not quit. Those people on your prayer list, draw a line now under their name and really bear down on that. For 25 years we prayed for this guy. Came to the Lord, loves God with all of his heart. We're just so grateful for that. I've been serving you all these years I've been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours. Yet you've never given me a kid and we're not talking about children here. There's no animal child sacrifice going on. I made a joke about that with my daughter one time. Got in a huge amount of trouble so that's not going to happen anymore. <laughs> uh, that I might be merry with my friends but when, listen to this, this son of yours, I'm going to jump back one slide, um, and the dad had said, your brother has come. Your brother has come. But the elder son doesn't refer to, he could have said, but when my bro younger brother came back, this son of yours, he's not any part of my family anymore. When he left, I cut him off. When we heard about all that mess he was engaged in, I cut him off even further, even stronger. This one, this son of yours came who has devoured your wealth with harlots. By the way, that's the way we know what was going on over in the Decapolis or wherever it was on the other side of the Sea of Galilee with all, hanging out with all those Gentiles, you know, us, <laughs> those pagans. Um, this is where we hear about it secondhand through his brother's mouth. Devoured your wealth with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. Um, I just want you to, to, to underline this. We're due for a break. This father allows the, ex, an expression of disobedience and disrespect. He allows it. He, allow, he gives the line. And then he's wanting the whole time, the years this guy was gone, he's desiring the restoration of those who've gone astray. And he also takes the initiative. He runs and meets him when he was a great way off. And then he rejoices in restoration. Can you compare the response of the elder son with the response of the father? This is the God that we serve. This is the father that has called us back into relationship with him as sons and daughters, robed with the best, given the ring, and put in the place of priority. And I'm thankful for that. I trust that you are too.